This recording is about electrical safety. It is intended for neurophysiologists and EEG technicians. The first section of this talk will be conducted in a conversational style. For the second section, I will switch to a question and answer format. This talk has a single objective, to avoid electric shock. So we must start by defining what we want to avoid. This frame has a red lightning bolt representing incoming electricity and a yellow figurine depicting a person in a funny position. This cartoon, the red lighting bolt and the yellow figurine will be used during this talk as a symbol for electric shock. The definition of an electric shock is straightforward. An electric shock is the clinical manifestation of electrical current going through the body. The type and intensity of the clinical manifestations brought about by current going through the body depends on several factors. These factors are the magnitude of the current, the site of entry of the current, the duration of the current, the volume of distribution of the current within the body, the path of the current, the type of current, direct or alternating, and if alternating, the frequency of the current. In the next few minutes, I will expand on each of these factors. Let us start with the magnitude of the current. The relation between the magnitude of the current and the severity of the clinical symptoms is very clear. The higher the magnitude, the more severe are the symptoms. Exposure to a small electrical current produces less severe manifestations. Exposure to a large current produces more severe manifestations. The next factor to be considered after the magnitude of the current is the site of introduction of the current. Site of current introduction in this talk refers to the depth of current when it makes first contact with the patient. Exposure to the same amount of current as indicated in this frame by the same number of plus signs at both ends of the chart will produce in a patient with an intact skin less severe manifestations than when the exposure takes place in an abrasive area of the skin, a still more severe clinical manifestation will occur if the skin is penetrated by a needle and the most severe manifestation will occur if the current is introduced in the proximity of the heart. The next factor that influences the severity of the clinical manifestations induced by current is duration. Duration as magnitude has a direct 
relation with severity. The longer the exposure to current, the worse things get. After the duration of current, we must consider the volume of distribution of the current. Volume of distribution, here simplified as weight, has an inverse relation to severity. The heavier a person is, the more room for current to be distributed, the lesser the density of the current, the lesser harm the current will do. The next important factor in determining the severity of an electric shock is the path the current takes. The path of the current includes the point of entry, the trajectory, and the point of exit. The relation between current path and severity has traditionally been linked for the most part to cardiac involvement, especially to ventricular fibrillation. I will, at this point, follow this tradition. The closer to the heart a current path travels, the more likely it is for ventricular fibrillation to occur. So, when the port of entry of current is the skin of a lower limb and the trajectory only involves the lower limbs and the lower pelvis, as it is depicted in this frame, the likelihood of ventricular fibrillation is very small. This is so because the heart is far from the path of the current. When the path of the current involves the right arm and leg, ventricular fibrillation is more likely because the electrical current path is now closer to the heart. But still, the risk of ventricular fibrillation in this circumstance is very small. When current enters through the right arm and exits through the left leg, ventricular fibrillation is more likely than in the other two prior situations. When current goes from the left arm to the right leg, the risk of ventricular fibrillation is still higher. And when the path of current goes from an arm to the other, the risk of ventricular fibrillation is the highest. In addition to the path of current, we have to consider the type of current. Direct current produces less severe clinical manifestations than alternating current. In addition, when dealing with alternating current, we have to take into account the frequency of the current. Frequencies between 50 and 90 Hertz are most dangerous. But the most dangerous of all is the one we use in our homes and at the hospital, 60 Hertz. Now that we have talked about most of the factors influencing the severity of an electric shock, I am going to bring a friend of mine to ask a question. What bad things can electricity do to humans? I will start to answer this question by showing you the triangle I use to work out problems regarding Ohm's law. E stands for electrical force, measuring volts. R stands for resistance, measured in ohms, 
and I stands for current. The unit of current is the amp. This table states the obvious that is often forgotten and brings confusion at the time of taking the neurophysiology boards. As you can see, I am using amps in this table, but the same can be said regarding ohms or volts. So, one amp corresponds to 1000 milliamps and a million microamps. One milliamp correspond to 0 0.001 amp, 1 microamp corresponds to 0 0.001 milliamp. So now that we know the units for current, we can in our chart, remove the word current and in its place introduce the word amp. We can also substitute the plus signs by actual numbers. In the first half of the chart, the values will be given in milliamps and in the second half of the chart, in amps. So now we must consider what happens to the human body as the exposure to amp are increased. To answer this question properly, scientists in the past conducted an experiment that would probably not be allowed today. The experiment was related by Olson in a paper titled Electrical Safety. The experiment consisted of using the amount of amps exposure, that is the magnitude of the current, as the only factor subject to modification, that is, as the only variable, while keeping all other factors fixed. This was achieved by recruiting individuals with very specific characteristics. The individuals selected had no skin abrasion in the hands and were willing to hold a copper wire in each hand between one and three seconds. The selected individuals were all men weighing 70 kilograms and the path induced by the current was from one hand to the other. The current use was alternating with a frequency of 60 Hertz. So having control all previously mentioned factors by using 60 Hertz alternating current supplied by copper wires held in both hands for one or three seconds in men weighing 70 kilograms, the scientist went ahead applying current and monitoring clinical manifestations. In such a control environment, a tingling sensation was felt by most sensitive individuals studied at about 0 0.5 milliamps. The majority of individuals had perception of electricity by about 1.5 to 2 milliamps. Yet, some did not feel a tingling sensation until about 5 milliamps. Hence, it is conceivable, based on this data, that some individuals may pass the accepted safe level of current at the level of the skin, which is 5 milliamps, before they perceive electricity. 
the let go current was also measured. The let go current is defined as the maximal current at which a subject can withdraw voluntarily from holding a life wire. Some individuals, when exposed to 6 milliamps, were unable to let go of the current source. Yet, other individuals were able to let go of the wires even when exposed to currents of about 100 milliamps. It is interesting that alternating current with a frequency of 50 to 60 hertz, the one we use, is more likely to produce contraction than alternating current at any other frequency. Respiratory paralysis, probably due to diaphragmatic contraction, was observed with as little as 18 milliamps of current. Fatigue and pain was also felt at this magnitude of current. The threshold for ventricular fibrillation in the most vulnerable volunteers in the setting of this experiment was about 75 milliamps. The values ex expressed in this chart are as stated by Olson. Books, often with no specifications regarding the variables involved, give slightly different numbers. I have chosen three books. The three books you see here, Levine and Luther's Comprehensive Clinical Neurophysiology, Tyner's Fundament Fundamentals of EG Technology, and Jasper Clinical Neurophysiology. As you can see, and as you would expect when drawing information from so many different sources, as I have done to create this chart, the list of symptoms on the left side of this chart is more extensive than the number of symptoms that I introduced to you before when I was taking all the information from a single source. I also would like you to notice before diving into this chart that the values in this chart are given in milliamps unless the number is followed by the letter A. In this case, the letter A is implying amps. So, now we're going to go about the specifics. Let's start with the threshold for sensation. The threshold for sensation in the fundamentals of EEG technology using an alternating current at 60 Hertz is listed as 300 microamps. The maximal harmless level is listed at 5 milliamps. In the Fundamentals of EEG Technology book and in Jasper's Clinical Neurophysiology, ventricular fibrillation following skin contact is listed to occur at about 100 milliamps. This number is pretty consistent. As you can see in the three books I chose to put together for this talk. Another important point 
that fall in the category of anecdotal is macroshocks and microshocks. Macroshocks refers to externally applied current in this frame represented by alternating current entering by the head exiting through the leg some qualify the externally applied current to define macroshock with words such as large symptom producing or ventricular fibrillating producing others quantify the amount of external current that defines microshock as more than 300 microamps. The definition of microshock is also vague in the literature, but it has three constants. The first constant is that microshock involves current below the cutaneous threshold for sensation that is less than 300 microamps. The second constant is that microshocks only occur in patients with intravenous device close to the heart. The third constant is the production of ventricular fibrillation. Microshock dose may have two ports of entry. One port of entry is via the central catheter as it is depicted in this frame in this case the current is placed directly or almost directly in the heart the other port of entry in cases of microshock is the skin in patients with central catheters or cardiac implants the reason for this later group of patients being vulnerable to microshock is that these devices create a low resistant path for electrical current. Such a path behaves like a magnet attracting current to it, thus leading to a disproportionately high density of current around the heart. Before leaving the topic of clinical manifestation and magnitude of current, I think that it's worth remembering that the usual magnitude of current delivered to the homes and hospitals in the United States is in the range of 15 to 20 amps. The distinction between the 15 and the 15-20 amps delivery systems can be made by observing the electrical receptacles. If the receptacle has two slots, the receptacle delivers 15 milliamps of current. If the receptacle has three slots and the longest of the slots is a rectangle, it also delivers 50 amps. If the receptacle has three slots and one of the slots has a T-shape, then it delivers 15 to 20 amps. I like at this junction to take a few seconds to remind you of the definition of electric shock. An electric shock is the clinical manifestation of electrical current going through the body. Up to now, we have only talked about the first part of this definition, the clinical manifestations. Now, I would like to address the second part of this definition. 
That is the part about electrical current going through the body. For current to travel through a body, two conditions must be met. The first condition is a voltage imbalance between two points in the body. Let us use as an example the right arm as the place where the increased voltage makes contact with the body and indicate this by a circle and the letter V with an up arrow. Let us use the left leg of the figurine as the region of the body with the lowest voltage and indicate this by a circle and the letter V with a down arrow. The second condition is a return path for the current. I am indicating the return path that is the circuit by the red arrow starting at the point of entry and terminating at the red thunderbolt. I would like at this point to comment on the structures that are represented in the segment of the red arrow between the tip of the white arrow going up and the tip of the white arrow going down. This segment of the circuit in this diagram represented is the electric power distribution system. Talking about an electric power distribution system may seem to you at this point like taking a detour, but as the talk goes on, you will be glad we started our discussion about electrical elements talking about it. In an older version of the book, Clinical Neurophysiology, in the chapter on electrical safety, the heading of the first paragraph was electric power distribution system. The explanation in the first paragraph is accompanied by a figure that further clarifies how electricity reaches the wall receptacle at the hospital. This drawing attempts in a more artistic way to accomplish the same thing. The lower part of this drawing represents a river coming down from a mountain. The flow of the river is driving the turbines of a power plant which produces electricity. The electricity produced by the power plant is boosted by a gadget to deliver high voltage electricity in the range of 4,800 volts, which is reduced by a second gadget to 120 volts. Once the electricity is reduced to 120 volts, it is then delivered to the hospital. The electricity is delivered to the hospital to be available at the wall receptacle for the purpose of powering hospital equipments. The drawing above shows the same thing in a more schematic fashion. The purpose of this schematization is to better show the entrance of electricity to the hospital, the presence of a hot wire bringing 120 volts, the presence of a neutral wire which should have close to zero voltage because of its connection with earth, the hospital equipment connected 
to a receptacle which is independently connected to Earth. So, as you can see here, two Earth ground connections are necessary to bring electricity from the power plant to the hospital. This double connection highlights the role that Earth plays in electricity. Earth provides an universal conductor that communicates all electrical units, including humans, with each other. Now that we have described an electric power distribution system, let's go back to the figure describing electric shock. So we are back considering the stretch of the circuit that generates the voltage imbalance that drives electricity through the body. This stretch is made of three components. The power plant, Mother Earth, and the receptacle and its connections. But one more condition has to be met in order for current to travel through the body. A while back when I said something to the reference that Earth connects us all via electricity, I was not being philosophical, I was being factual. Not only Earth connects all humans and all animals, but it connects all electrically harboring entities with movable ions or electrons. Thus, it is unlikely that the circuit through the body be the only available circuit for electricity to complete its journey back to its place of origin, through Earth. Therefore, for an electric shock to occur, the circuit through the body must have less resistance than any other available circuit. So, in the next frame, I will introduce a new circuit. As you can see, this circuit is depicted as not going through the body. The condition that must be met for electricity to travel through the body in the presence of an alternative circuit is, as we stated, that the resistance of the body circuit be smaller than the resistance of the alternative circuit. I am representing in this frame the lower resistance of the body as a green arrow pointing down on top of the ohm sign. And the increased resistance of the alternative circuit as an upgoing arrow on top of an ohm side close to the alternative circuit. But still, the link between the wall electrical receptacle and the human getting the electric shock has not been established, a fact that has not gone unnoticed by the inquisitive monkey. So at this point, he asked a quick question. How does electricity go from the receptacle to the human? The short answer to this question is through a power source. Power source is the name used to refer to the missing link between human and electricity. Here, that missing link is indicated by the blue arrow connecting with the red thunderbolt 
representing the incoming electricity. So, what are the power sources in a hospital setting? A power source could be a live wire being electrocuted by a live wire has three reasons. They are listed in this frame. The first one is stupidity, if you are an adult, or mischievousness, if you are a child. This situation will arise by introducing an object in the life slot of an electrical socket. I have depicted the object as being the pin of an old electrode. This was apparent more common than we think and it was because of this that the pins were substituted by receptors in the new electrodes. The second situation that may lead an individual to suffer an electric shock due to contact with the live wire is bad luck. Another way of referring to bad luck is a single fault. An example of a single fault is when a wire breaks and comes in contact with the chassis of an ungrounded equipment. If an equipment, let's say a toaster with no ground, that is working well, breaks and it stops working due to a, a broken wire, and the wire comes in contact with the chassis of the toaster, the event that we refer to as a single fault, what will happen in such a situation is that current will pass from the broken wire to the chassis. Instead of being conducted through the filaments back to the neutral wire. And since the equipment is ungrounded and usually isolated from the ground by a rubber stand, the electricity will lurk in the chassis. So the chassis may get hot and if touched by a person and that person is in contact with the ground, an electric shock will happen. The third possibility of suffering an electric shock due to becoming in contact with a live wire is having very bad luck. When I refer to very bad luck, I refer to two things going wrong at the same time in the same equipment. This situation is referred to as a double fault. Double fault occur in grounded equipments. The ground is here represented by a green line. When such an equipment breaks in two places, as we have just mentioned, first in the primary wiring and secondly in the ground wire, in such an event the electrical current instead of being conducted through the ground wire back to the electrical socket and back to the earth ground, the current stays lurking in the chassis as it did in the ungrounded equipment. If the chassis is made of metal, it will get hot, and if touched by a person in contact with earth ground, the person will get an electric shock. So, you just heard about live wires. Now, I will explain about uneven grounds as a power source. If you remember when we spoke about electrical circuits, we said that one of the requisites for electricity to flow is 
a voltage imbalance. The presence of a voltage imbalance is intuitive in the case of a live wire. A person while standing on the ground with a voltage of about zero gets exposed to a voltage of, a, of 120 volts. The presence of voltage imbalance when relates to an uneven ground is not intuitive. In the next few slides, I will explain that to you. As you remember, if resistance of a circuit goes up, while the current remains the same, the electrical force, that is the voltage of the circuit, will go up. This is what happens when two equipments are connected to one patient and one of the equipment's ground has a higher resistance than the other. This situation is often referred to as non-equipotential grounds. I will tell you about six situations that can produce non equipotential grounds. The first situation is when one of the equipments connected to a patient has a ground and the second equipment does not. I will go over the components of this frame so we can understand this concept better and to serve as a guide for other similar frames. The arrow points to a patient in a bed. An EEG electrode connects the head to the EEG machine, itself connected to a three-slot electrical receptor, connected to a fuse box, connected to a ground. On the other side, we have another electrode connected to a cardiac monitor device that is connected to a two-slot electrical receptor with no ground connection. To understand the significance of this situation, we must think as to the relation between resistance, current, and voltage in the brain circuit and in the heart circuit. The low resistance circuit on the EG side, because of the presence of a ground connection, prevents the unavoidable straight current intrinsic of all electrical equipment from producing a significant voltage surge. On the cardiac side, the infinite resistance that results from the absence of any conductance renders the presence of a straight current a potential risk for a voltage surge. This situation sets the stage for an electric shock by creating a voltage imbalance consisting of high voltage in the leg connected to the cardiac electrode and low voltage at the scalp where the EEG electrode is connected. The second situation that may create a power source is the use of cheaters. Cheaters are used to adapt a two slot wall receptor to a three-slot cable, this adaptation is purely cosmetic and the circuit so created behaves on the, the same premises than the one we have just described in the previous section. Consequently, a potential voltage imbalance will be created. The third situation that creates a power source because of non-equipotential grounds is the use 
of an extension cord. An extension cord connected to an electrical circuit behaves similarly to multiple resistors in series. As you know, resistors in series increase the overall resistance of a circuit, or in this case, the resistance of one leg of the circuit. The increased resistance in one leg of the circuit will potentially create a voltage imbalance. The fourth situation is the use of an equipment with a broken ground. In this frame, both equipments are connected to one electrical box going to one ground. But there is trouble in paradise. There is something wrong with the ground prong of the electrical plug. The trouble is a broken ground pin. A broken ground pin increases the resistance in the affected leg of the circuit, thus creating a potential voltage imbalance. The fifth situation is when the broken ground is behind the electrical receptor that is between the wall receptacle and the electrical box the consequence is a potential voltage imbalance the sixth and final situation is when two equipments connected to a patient are ultimately coupled to different electrical boxes and the boxes are linked to ground through lines of unequal distance. In this situation, the one with the longer line will have more resistance and if exposed to similar current will generate higher voltage thus creating a voltage imbalance. So we have spoken about electric shock as a consequence of stupidity or mischievousness, single fault and double fault. We just spoke of uneven ground behaving like a power source. Now we're going to talk about leaky currents arising from electrical equipment behaving like a power source. The mechanism of leaky current production stems from the attribute of electricity to produce inductive current due to expanding and contracting magnetic fields and capacitor current due to expanding and contracting electrical fields. Every electrical equipment from the first EEG machine to a later model to the newest EEG machine model is made of electrical wires, amplifiers, transformers and other electrical elements. And Wherever there is wire and electrical elements, there will be stray currents. Stray currents are generated by internal wiring, by transformers, and by amplifiers. These structures produce a stray current as we previously mentioned, by creating expanding and contracting magnetic and electric fields. So far, I have used the term straight current to refer to the unintended currents generated by electricity. But since these currents are not confined to the structures generating them and they are often found beyond the confines of the equipment. The term 
leaky current is often used to refer to them. So we have just finished discussing leaky currents from equipment as a power source. I will now briefly address leaky currents arising from internal room wiring. Again, the source of the current is induction. This figure is similar to the one I have shown you previously. The only difference is that I have represented the internal room wiring. This is represented in this frame by the blue line enclosed in the rectangles ending in the light bulb. The arrows I had just added on top of the blue line are there to indicate the magnetic field generated by the internal room wiring. The yellow arrows below indicate the straight current generated by the magnetic forces. I have found at times when recording an EEG that just moving the bed a few inches is the difference between a clean record and an unreadable one because of continuous 60 Hz artifact. The internal room wiring in addition to producing inductive current also produces capacitance current as a consequence of the alternating nature of the current used to provide electricity in the hospitals. This figure is rather similar to the one I just showed you when explaining leaky currents resulting from induction. Three differences are palpable. One is the direction of the arrow on the blue line. The second one is the presence of arrows in the EEG leg of the circuit. And the third is that the arrows head are towards each other. I did this to indicate the interaction needed between different wiring systems to generate capacitant current. The yellow arrows in this frame indicate the direction of the current so generated. The final example I will give you regarding power sources is the generation of leaky current as a consequence of extension cords. It is estimated that one foot of extension cord while conducting the usual alternating current of 60 Hz and 120 volts will produce one microamp of current per foot. Hence, extension cord are bad because they may produce on equal grounds, as I mentioned initially, those generating voltage imbalance and also because they themselves produce leaky currents. So at this point I will end the conversational section of this talk and will switch to the question and answer format. The first question is one milliamp is equal to dash microamps A one hundred B one thousand C ten thousand D ten. I already presented this table to you during the first part of this talk. I do so again because it is important for you to have 
a concept of units. Milli units and micro units very clearly in your mind. In this case, the question referred to one milliamp. One milliamp is equal to a thousand microamps. So the answer to this question is B. The next question is which of the following is not true? A. Electricity always travels towards the point of less resistance. B. Electricity only travels if it knows it can come back. C. Electricity travels through rubber and plastic. D. Electricity travels through earth as if earth is a low resistant wire. I will use direct current and a few examples to explain the meaning of circuit to help you choose the right answer among the ones provided. Electricity in the form of current only travels if it knows it can come back and a voltage imbalance exists between where electricity is traveling from in arriving to. If the comeback path is interrupted, as depicted in this frame, current will cease. This figure depicts a man standing on a rubber tire. The man has one hand at one end of a wire and a foot at the other end of the wire. Thus, he is part of the electrical circuit and as such he will receive an electric shock. The fact that he is standing on a rubber tire that isolates him from the ground does not protect him from getting an electric shock. But if he removes his foot from the wire and as such he stops being part of the circuit, the current will cease and he will not get an electric shock. If instead of standing on a rubber tire, he stands on the ground and the ground is connected with one end of the battery as depicted in this frame, he will receive an electric shock because earth behaves like a low resistant wire but if it's standing on the ground and the circuit from the battery does not touch the ground he's standing on he will not receive an electric shock nor will he get an electric shock if a low resistance circuit is present between the two poles of the battery as long as the battery connection with the ground has a much higher resistance than that of the circuit connecting the two poles of the battery. This is so because electricity always chooses the circuit with less resistance. But if the battery is connected to the ground by a resistor with lower resistance than the original circuit as depicted in this frame, the man will become at least part of one of the life circuits and he will get an electric shock. But if he is wearing a special rubber shoes, he will not get an electric shock because now the electrical circuit formed by the battery resistor to the ground and the man will be gone. And the only available circuit 
for current to travel is between the two poles of the battery. So the answer to this question is C. Electricity will not travel through rubber or plastic. The resistance of the dry skin is less than a thousand ohms. A true, B false. It is interesting that Olson in his article about electrical safety states that the skin has a resistance ranging from 15,000 to 1 million ohms. Whereas in Levin and Luther's, it is stated that the skin impedance, which is a form of resistance, range from 5 to 10,000 ohms. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, a branch of the CDC, states as follows. Under dry conditions, the resistance offered by the human body may be as high as 100,000 ohms. Wet or broken skin may drop the body's resistance to 1,000 ohms. So the answer is B. All agree that the resistance of dry skin is more than 1,000 ohms. Next question. What is the resistance of intact wet skin? A. 20% of dry skin. B. 5% of dry skin. C. 10% of dry skin. D. 1% of dry skin. We already mentioned that the resistance of dry skin is 15,000 ohms or more. Three conditions often found in neurophysiology decrease the resistance of the skin. The resistance of wet skin is about 1% that of dry skin. The resistance of a skin if a needle penetrates the epidermis decreases to about the same. And even if the epidermis is abrased as it is during EEG electroplacement, the resistance of the skin also significantly goes down. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. What is the internal resistance between two limbs in adults? A, 200 ohms, B, 500 ohms, C, 1000 ohms, D, 800 ohms. The internal resistance of each limb once the skin has been breached is in the order of 200 ohms. The resistance of the trunk is about 100 ohms. The internal resistance of el to electricity traveling one limb to another is therefore about 500 ohms. So the answer is B. Next question. What is the resistance from the tip of a central catheter with an internal guide wire to the heart. A, 10 million ohms, B, 300 ohms, C, 2000 ohms, D, 70 ohms. The resistance from the tip of a central catheter to the heart is about 70 ohms. So the answer is D. Next question. The heart is most vulnerable to current during A, T wave, B, Q wave, C, PR interval, D, QRS complex. 
the heart is most vulnerable during T wave. So the answer is A. Next question. Earth ground resistance is considered almost zero. A true, B false. Earth ground resistance is considered the lowest, close to zero. The answer to this question is A. Electrical receptacles with no ground increase the chances of having an electric shock more than the use of cheater plugs. A true, B false. Electric receptacle with no ground have two slots, one hot and one neutral. Electrical sockets with three slots have one hot slot that is usually the smaller, so none of the bigger prongs can be introduced in it. A round or triangular shaped slot for the ground and for the neutral either a longer rectangular opening or a triangular slot. Cheaters are used to connect a three prong plug into a two slot electrical socket. It does not change anything, leaving the two slot socket the same. The answer is B. The next question is a straight current results from magnetism and capacitance. A true, B false. If we remember something about magnetism that we learned in high school is the right hand rule. The right hand rule, at least in one of its version, states that if we hold a wire conducting electricity in the direction of the thumb, Magnetic forces will be created as the current starts moving in the direction of the fingers. Therefore, if a wire conducting electricity is close to a second wire, the second wire will produce electricity. We call this phenomenon induction. If we remember something about capacitors that we learned in high school, we shall doubt very much. It would be that two wires close to each other behave like a capacitor. And as such, when electricity starts moving, it will create a field that will expand. And if a wire is in the proximity, it will produce electricity. We call this phenomenon capacitance current. So the answer to this question is A. The next question is a wire conducting direct current produces more capacitance current and inductive current than a wire conducting alternating current. A true, B false. 
both direct current and alternating current produce a straight current intermittently. Both of them do so by induction and capacitance. Direct current does so when it is turned on and off. Alternating current does so all the time except at the null points in each cycle. In this frame, the time electricity is producing straight current is represented by the green area. The time electricity is not producing a straight current is represented in gray. The answer to this question is B. False. The next question is, on grounded equipment have a theoretical risk of producing an electric shock even when working well. A true, B false. In this frame, I am representing a patient having an EEG done. The EEG machine is grounded and so is the patient. The patient is grounded through the bed. The wires going from the patient to the machine and from the machine to the receptacle are subject to capacitance and induction. The electricity produced by induction and capacitance will follow the path of less resistance to the ground receptacle. Because the resistance to the receptacle is lower than that of the resistance of the skin. Hence, the patient will not receive an electric shock. If the machine would instead of being grounded, would be ungrounded, stray current produced by the wire going from the patient to the machine and by the wire going from the machine to the receptacle not having a path to ground, electricity will take the path towards the patient and go through the patient. The patient will receive an electric shock. The answer to this question is A, true. I use the term theoretical in this question because modern EEG machines have enough safeguards built into them to prevent current from traveling towards the patient. Next question. On grounded equipment not intended to be in contact with the patient should be allowed in the patient's room. A. True. B. False. If a patient while having an EEG done touches an ungrounded lamp, the patient will not have any problems. If the lamp were to develop a fault and the lamp is connected to a two slot receptacle, the electrical current will find a path through the patient attempting to reach earth ground through the grounded equipment. The problem for the patient occurs at the interface between the lamp and the limb of the patient, as indicated here by an sphere. At this point, the patient will receive an electric shock. If, on the other hand, the lamp has a fault but is connected to a ground, the electricity will return through the ground wire to its own socket because the resistance is less than the resistance of the body. The patient 
will not receive an electric shock since the current goes to earth through the receptacle. So no two slot sockets should ever be used in a patient's room, nor should we use cheaters. The answer to this question is B, false. The next question is, a three slot receptacle with a broken ground behaves like a two slot receptacle. A, true, B, false. The broken ground pin provides more resistance than an unbroken one. So does a broken line between the electrical receptacle and the electrical box. In both of these cases, the broken ground will render the three slot receptacle as an ungrounded two slot receptacle. The answer to this question is A. Next question. This question is often asked in the board. The patient should only be connected to one ground regardless of the number of equipment connected to the patient, or if more than one, one ground is used, all grounds connected to the patient should go to the same electrical box going to the same earth ground through the same path. A true, B false. This frame represents a patient connected to an EG machine and to a cardiac monitoring device. The EEG machine has a ground electrode connected to the patient, but the ground electrode of the cardiac monitoring device is not. This is the first scenario introduced in this question. This arrangement is considered safe. The next scenario in this question, which is also safe, is to use multiple grounds but to connect all the grounds from the multiple equipments to the same terminal going to the same electrical box and to the same earth ground by the same route. So the answer to this question is true. But in reality Although electricity is, in my opinion, an intelligent life form, he or she does not know how to read. This analphabetism that afflicts electricity generates a very important question. How, among the many electrodes connected to the head during EEG, does electricity choose which electrode is the ground electrode? The answer to this question is that it does so by selecting the electrode with the least resistance. That is the ground electrode in the all analog EEG machines or the ground and the fixed reference electrodes in the newer digital EEG machines. These electrodes by virtue of their connections with all amplifiers have less resistance that than all others. One more observation, and I get off the subject. Remember, nor the patient's ground, nor any other electro connected to the patient is connected to the chassis of the equipment. And it is the chassis of the equipment that is connected through the wall receptacle to the earth ground. So now I go to the next question. The next question is, if all doctors use a special rubber shoes that provide complete isolation from ground, A. Patients will be protected against most electric shock. B. Doctors will be protected against most electric shock. C. Doctors and patients will be protected against most electric shocks. D. No one will be protected against electric shocks. 
Let's look at scenario number one. This frame depicts a doctor standing, touching a lamp with one hand and the patient with the other. The doctor has a special rubber shoes. Notice that the receptacles where the lamp and the EEG machine are connected have ground slots. Now the lamp develops a fault indicated in this frame by the yellow broken line inside the lamp. The lamp will get hot because electrical current has now come in contact with the chassis, but neither the doctor nor the patient will get electrocuted because the current from the broken lamp will go to the wall receptacle that it is connected to, since it has a lower resistance by virtue of the short distance between the lamp and the receptacle and its connection with the ground, then the circuit involving the doctor. The second scenario is a little more complicated. This frame depicts a doctor standing, touching a lamp with one hand and the patient with the other. The doctor has a special rubber shoes as he did in the last scenario. The ground wire is intact and the resistance of both sides is the same. This frame depicts the same situation but the wire from the electrical socket to the ground is broken on the side of the lamp, thus depriving it of a low resistant pathway to the earth ground. This raises the resistance of the ground lamp circuit. Then bad luck strikes again and the lamp develops a fault. Live wire come in contact with the chassis. Current looks for the lowest resistant path. It decides that since it cannot go to the ground by its own cord because it is broken to take the doctor's route. And so it goes through the doctor. The doctor does not get an electric shock because the voltage going through the hand touching the lamp is the same as the voltage of the hand touching the patient. Remember he has a special shoes that prevent him from being grounded. The patient is not so lucky since at the site of contact with the doctor the voltage is high and at the site of contact with the EEG electrode the voltage is very low. Thus the current traveling towards the earth ground strikes the patient producing an elec electric shock. So the answer to this question is B. But I advise you not to try it in real life unless you really trust the shoe brand. Next question, how does electricity causes injury? A, by electrical excitation of muscle and nerves. B, by resistive heating of tissue. C, by electrochemical burning. D, by all of the above. Muscle excitation leading to sustained contraction of the diaphragm, produces apnea. Partial, not synchronized cardiac muscle fibers excitation produces fibrillation. Complete synchronized cardiac muscle fiber excitation produces defibrillation. The main difference between electricity producing fibrillation or defibrillation is the extent of the heart involvement. Fibrillation will occur if only a limited number of muscle fibers get stimulated. The fibrillation will occur if all muscle fibers are stimulated at the same time. Lesions 
due to resistive heating of tissue and electrochemical burning are too ugly to show. So the answer is D. Next question. What is different between microshock and macroshock? A. The presence of cutaneous manifestation. B. The presence of invasive devices. C. The magnitude of the current. D. All of the above. A macroshock is the clinical consequence of a large externally applied current. The magnitude of the current is above the perception threshold. A micro shock is defined as a small quantity of electricity, not large enough to be perceived if applied to the skin, but capable of producing ventricular fibrillation if applied to the skin in patients with internal devices close to the heart or if applied directly to an internal device. The answer to this question is D. The next question is, which of the following situations is more likely to produce microshock? A. A sticking a pin into the hot slot of an electrical receptacle. B. Equipments with uneven grounds. C. Leaky current from an equipment. D. Leaky current from internal room wiring. Introducing the pin of an old electrode in the life slot of an electrical receptacle will most certainly be perceived by the individual and produce a macro shock. Since the current coming out of the life slot will be about 15 amps. And as you know, current is perceived at about 300 microamps. On even grounds, as it occurred when a loop involved a patient, a grounded equipment, and a non-grounded equipment is likely to produce a micro shock, especially if a fault occurs in the non-rounded equipment. As we stated before, the magnitude of current needed to produce a micro shock is less than 300 microamps. The same can be said about the normal leaky current emanating from a non-grounded EEG machine or even a grounded EEG machine and from internal room wiring. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. In a not at risk patient, what is the least amount of current applied to the skin that would produce ventricular fibrillation? A. 20 milliamps. B. 100 milliamps, C, 150 milliamps, D, 200 milliamps. The values given in fundamental of AG technology are as follows. Perception, 300 microamps. Cutaneous pain, 1 milliamp. Ventricular fibrillation, if current is introduced directly or close to the heart, 100 microamps. Ventricular fibrillation, if currently is externally applied, 100 milliamps. In Levin and Luders, the numbers given for skin exposure capable of producing ventricular fibrillation is 100 milliamps for current introduced internally close to the heart in page 32 of the same book gives a number of 180 microamps 
and in page 35 150 to 200 microamps yet they point out that dogs experimentally exposed to as little as 20 microamps have developed ventricular fibrillation and in the article by Olson the value given as lowest threshold for ventricular fibrillation for an average human was 75 milliamps remember that in this experiment electricity was externally applied so the answer to this question is B a veterinarian should probably answer A next question it takes as little as of 60 hertz current applied to the skin to produce death in a not at risk average patient A 20 milliamps B 100 milliamps C 150 milliamps D 200 milliamps current as small as 20 milliamps externally applied if sustained may produce diaphragmatic contraction and asphyxia so the answer to this question is a next question a device that transforms electrical current into magnetism and then back to electrical current is called a diode true or false a device that transforms electrical current into magnetism and then back to electrical current is called a transformer it consists of a metal core primary winding wires through which electricity comes in and secondary winding wires through which electricity goes out the type of transformer I have so far presented to you is called a step up transformer transformers are called a step up transformers when the voltage coming in is less than the voltage going out the name step down transformer is used when the voltage coming in is higher than the voltage going out the name isolation transformer is used when the primary winding wires are grounded and the secondary winding wires are not grounded so transformers go from electricity to magnetism to electricity the answer to this question is B false next question isolation transformer can be used to prevent electrical shock a true B false the benefit of ungrounded current is that when coupled with ungrounded equipment a fault do not lead to an electrical shock this benefit is lost if the equipment is grounded in such a case electric shock will occur if a fault happens so the answer is a next question diodes can be used to prevent electric shock a true b false light emitting diodes transform electrons into photons and then back into electrons the greatness of light emitting diode is that the light receptor cell does not produce photons it can only receive them so the direction of the current is only from the light producing element to the light receptor cell 
the symbol for light emitting diode is very peculiar, as you can see pointed by the arrow. The EG machine has benefited a lot from the use of diodes because it allows the electricity from the brain to be captured by the EEG machine while preventing any electricity from the EEG machine to reach the brain. Since, as I previously mentioned, light only goes from the photon emission, as indicated by the magneta arrow, to the light receptor cell and not the other way around. The answer to this question is A. Next question. EEG machine uses diodes to decrease straight current. True or false? Diodes can be used to transform alternating current into direct current. And as you remember from prior discussion, direct current produces less straight current than alternating current. So the answer to this question is A. The EEG machine should be plugged to an outlet with a dot, A blue, B white, C green, D black. The EEG machine should be plugged to an outlet with a green dot. The green dot in a receptacle indicates good working condition and high degree of safety. So the answer is C. Next question. Which of the following individuals are at risk for electrical injury? A. People near by to an electrical device. B. People connected to an electrical device by electrodes attached to the skin. C. Neonates connected to an EEG machine. D. All of the above. People nearby an electrical device are at risk for electrical injury, but the risk is very low. Individuals in this category are classified as group 1. People in contact with an electrical device are at risk for electrical injury. The risk is significant. Individuals in this category are classified as group 2. People connected to an electrical device and to an internal catheter close or near the heart are at high risk for a significant electric shock. Individuals in this category are classified as group 3. And so are all neonates connected to an electrical device even without central connections. Neonates are classified as group 3 in virtue of a lower skin resistance and smaller volume of distribution of current. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. The safest equipment are labeled type CF. A true, B false. Classification of medical equipment is rather complicated. Most medical instruments have two labels. One refers to the equipment and the other to parts of the equipment. The labeling of the equipment determines the equipment class. Equipments have three classes. Class one is represented by a circle and an electrical symbol for ground. The label implies that the protection against delivering an electric shock relies on being grounded. Class 2 equipment symbols is one square inside another. The label implies that the protection against delivering an electric shock relies on having double insulation. Class 3 equipment symbol is a rhomboid 
with three straight lines in sight. This label implies that the protection against delivering an electric shock relies on using no voltage higher than 25 volts if employing alternating current or 60 volts if employing direct current. These voltage levels are referred to as safety extra low voltage. The parts of an equipment that come in contact with the patient are labeled in types. The parts of an equipment label B are generally not conductive and can be immediately released from the patient. Type B parts are the ones with less probability of producing an electric shock and therefore the parts that require the least number of built-in safety features. The symbol for type B is the figure of a human. Type BF is more stringent than type B. The label of BF is generally used for devices that have conductive contact with the patient or that are attached to the patient for a relatively long time. The label is a human inside square. BF stands for body floating. Type CF is the most stringent classification. This label is used for those parts of an equipment where the applied part is in direct conductive contact with the heart or its proximity. It implies that the heart is floating. It also implies that even if a fault in the equipment occurs, the part labeled CF will protect the patient's heart. The answer to this question is B, because CF designation is for part of an equipment and not for the equipment itself. Next question, current stoppers are the most sensitive system to interrupt current flow. A true, B false. The simplest device to stop current flow is a fuse. The fuse is merely a thinner wire that breaks apart when current traveling through it is above the set amount tolerated by the consistency of the wire. Fuses have to be replaced. I added two types of fuses in the corner just to give you an idea of how they look. Another duration limiting device is the circuit breaker. The circuit breaker is usually located in the main electrical box and usually serves multiple appliances. The circuit breaker goes off if more than the selected currents go through them. By far the most sensitive device to stop current is generally called a current stop detector. This device breaks the flow of current when there is a difference in the current between the in and out leg of a circuit that is above 10 milliamps and it does so in less than one millisecond. Current stop detectors have many names. You can pause the flick and read them if you are interested. The answer to this question is A. True. Next question. Current stop detectors interrupt current flow in the presence of a voltage discrepancy in the circuit. A. True. B. False. I will use this figure to explain how current stop detectors work. The magenta arrow points to a current stop detector. In addition, 
to the current stop detector, this circuit includes an isolation transformer and a non-grounded equipment. The man touching the ungrounded equipment, that is the toaster, is happy because he is not getting electrocuted. I have enlarged the current stopper device to make it easy for you to see how it works. Now I'd like to call your attention to the current going through the circuit. As you can see, it is 10 amps. At this point, the current going towards the toaster and coming out from the toaster are the same. Now a fault occurs in the toaster. Immediately the current going towards the toaster and the current going away from the toaster are no longer the same. The one at the bottom, as you can see, has changed to 9.989 amps. And in about one millisecond, the current stop detector will interrupt the circuit. Notice that the yellow lines above are no longer in continuity. Then immediately, the toaster will shut down. The man is still happy because current was stopped so fast that he did not feel it. So the answer to this question is B. The answer to this question is B. Because current stoppers stop flow of electricity when there is an amp discrepancy and not a voltage discrepancy. The next question is the maximum acceptable leakage current in an equipment used in NICU should be dash microamps A 10 B 100 C 5 D 20 Maximum acceptable leakage current in an equipment not meant to be in contact with a patient is 500 microamps. Maximum acceptable leakage current in an equipment meant to be in contact with a patient is 100 microamps. Maximum acceptable leakage current in an equipment meant to be in contact with a patient undergoing central catheterization or any type of line close to the heart is 10 microamps. Maximum acceptable leakage current in an equipment meant to be in contact with the neonate is 10 microamps. So the answer is A. Next question. All of the following are steps taken by the EEG machine manufacturers to prevent electric shock, except A. Using light emitting diodes, B. Using a step down transformers, C. Using isolation transformers, D. Adding a fixed reference to the EEG machine. An obvious fact is that the electricity produced by the brain is not enough to drive an EEG machine. So an outside source of electricity is needed. It is also obvious that we do not want any electricity from the EEG machine going to the brain. And that in order to monitor the brain 
electrical activity, we need the electricity from the brain to get to the EEG machine. It is intuitive, therefore, that separating the amplifier receiving the brain electrical activity from the rest of the EEG machine is a good idea. Once this was done, it became an easy job to safely provide electricity to the bulk of the EEG machine. This was done by delivering the current from a grounded receptacle and having the EEG machine chassis grounded, as we have done in this frame. A far more difficult engineering situation was to provide the amplifier with electricity, the electricity needed to magnify brain electrical signal. For this purpose, the engineers took three steps. The first step was limiting the amount of electricity reaching the differential amplifier to as little as possible. The second step was keeping the differential amplifier ungrounded. so the amplifier would no longer be in contact with the ground earth. And the third step was to create a one way to transfer the electricity from the amplifier to the bulk of the EEG machine while not allowing the electricity from the bulk of the EEG machine to go back to the differential amplifier. How can these things be achieved? Reducing the amount of electricity going to the amplifier was achieved by introducing two elements to the EEG machine. The step down transformer to bring the voltage down and the diode to transform alternating current to direct current. The ungrounding of the differential amplifier was achieved by introducing another element. This added element was the isolation transformer. The conduction of a one-way highway for electricity from the amplifier to the bulk of the EE machine was achieved by incorporating a light emitting diode. So the answer to this question is D. Methods of preventing electric shocks in the case of an EEG machine fault include all of the following except A. Isolating brain electrical activity B. Limiting the duration of exposure to current C. Limiting leaky current. D. Grounding the patient. In addition to the steps taken to prevent current from getting to the patient in a no fault circumstances, the EEG machine manufacturers develop other safeguards so that in the event of a fault the exposure to current will be minimal. I am sure that you can think of what those mechanisms are. One is using current stoppers and the other one is using fuses. So the answer to this question is D. The next question is which of the following should an EEG technician not do? A. Check instrument before recording. B. Check wire before recording. C. 
turn the machine on before connecting the AG leads. D. Turn the machine off before disconnecting the EEG leads. The technician must inspect the instrument before recording. If wet, do not use it. If broken, do not use it. They must also check the cord. If damaged, do not use it. If the prongs are loose or out of place, do not use it. The technician must also follow a very strict order of operation. When about to start the EEG, the machine should turn from off to on before putting the electrodes on the scalp. Then the electrodes should be put on, the EEG should be done, the EEG once finished, the electrodes should be taken out, that is the patient should be on hook while the machine is still on. The machine should be kept on until all electrodes are out. Then once all electrodes are off, the patient, the machine should be turned off. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, the force required to withdraw a normal ground pin from the receptacle should be no less than dash ounces. A, 100, B, 5, C, 10, D, 20. A good electric plug should not come out of the socket unless it is pulled by a force of more than 10 ounces. The ground prong from the cord cap should not dislodge from the cord cap at forces of less than 10 ounces. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. The maximum allowable current leakage through any patient's EEG lead is dash microamps at 120 volts A 10 B 100 C 900 D 1000 Testing for allowable current leakage should be done under four conditions normal and reversible polarity of the hot and neutral wires with equipment power switched on and off. All this testing may sound difficult, but in reality, the only thing you need to do is to plug the cable of the EEG machine to the EEG checking instrument. All the steps are automatically programmed into the instrument. In an equipment labeled with the symbol of a body, the maximum allowable current leakage in a no-fault situation is 100 microamps. In the event of a single fault, the maximum allowable current leakage is 500 microamps. In an equipment labeled by a human in a box, if no fault is present, the maximum allowable current leakage is 100 microamps. Or if a fault is present, it should be no more than 500 microamps. 
in an equipment with the label of a heart in a square box. If no fault is present, the maximum allowable current leakage is 10 microamps. And if a fault is present, it is 50 microamps. Please remember that although the symbols we have just listed are printed in the equipment as a label, these symbols refer to the part of the equipment in contact with the patient and not to the whole equipment. So the answer to this question is A. I will sneak two questions about electrical safety and nerve conduction testing. I will do this to avoid talking about this painful subject later on in the year. The next question is, which of the following is fault? A. If possible, two nerve conduction studies contralateral to the central line. B. Do not do proximal stimulation of the limb with the central line. C. Do not do nerve conduction studies in a patient with intravenous line if infusing normal saline. D. External pacemakers wire do not contraindicate nerve conduction studies. This frame depicts a patient on, a, on an examining bed. Notice that the bed is and should be made of wood and that the wheels are made of rubber. The patient is connected to a central line in this frame. Since there is an electrolyte solution in the central line, the central line is a good conductor of electricity. And now he is getting a nerve conduction study in the other arm. Stimulation should not be done proximal and ipsilateral to the central line. In this frame, the patient has a peripheral IV. In a patient with a peripheral IV, it is fine to do nerve conduction studies anywhere regardless of the IV solution being used. Proximal location is fine In regarding nerve conduction studies, I like to give you two other words of advice. One, get a cardiology consult in all patients with an implantable automatic cardiovector defibrillator or any type of cardiac pacemaker. Two, have a crash card available so if something bad happens, you can act quickly. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Which of the following is false? When doing nerve conduction studies in a patient with implantable pacemaker or automatic cardiovector defibrillations, A. Keep a distance of 6 inches between the stimulator and the implant. B. Keep stimulus duration to less than 0 0.2 milliseconds. C. Keep a stimulation rate to less than 1 hertz. D. Do testing on the arm that is ipsilateral to the implant. This frame depicts a patient in an examining table, just like the other patient, but this one has a big heart. The black box with a white border represents an implantable pacemaker. If a nerve conduction, ENG, or repetitive nerve stimulation test is to be performed, certain precautions should be taken. If possible, use the arm opposite to the implanted pacemaker, usually the right arm, but in addition, keep a distance of more than 6 inches between the stimulator and the implant. Keep stimulus duration to less than 0 0.2 milliseconds and keep a stimulation rate to less 
than 1 hertz. So the answer is D. Next question. All equipment should be checked every six months. A true, B false. The equipment should be inspected every time it is used. A deeper inspection, including stimation of leaky current, should be made every 6 to 12 months. So the answer to this question is A. Thank you.